Hello, and welcome to Mission San Luis, a 17th century Spanish mission to the Appalachian Indians located in present-day Tallahassee, Florida. My name is Jerry Lee, and I'm an archaeologist with Florida's Bureau of Archaeological Research stationed here at the mission. Today, I'd like to share with you some of the things we learned from our excavations of San Luis Convento. The Convento was where Franciscan friars resided at the mission, and I'll use the term friary in our discussion. Mission San Luis was the Spaniards' provincial capital of Appalachian province, the area between the Osceola and Oclockney rivers and the homeland of the Appalachians. The site we have investigated is actually the second location of San Luis, and it existed here from about 1656 until it was abandoned in 1704 because of the threat of English invasion. During those near 50 years, San Luis was the largest or nearly the largest of the Spanish Appalachian missions. It wasn't an average mission. It served 1,400 Appalachians, but was also home to a range of Spaniards, including Franciscan friars, administrators, soldiers, and civilians. The friary was the second largest building in the religious complex at San Luis, which consisted of the church, the friary, and the kitchen. This three-structure plan has been seen at a couple of other missions, and a 1691 map of another mission, although idealized, also depicts the three buildings. The friary was the second major structure to be excavated at San Luis, and it was originally believed to be the mission church. There were a couple of different lines of evidence that suggested that identification might be in error. Later, excavations that encountered structural remains at the edge of what was originally thought to be a detached cemetery proved the correct identification of the structure as the friary. The friary was located a little over 30 meters north of the mission church and was situated at nearly the same northwest to southeast orientation. Besides being at virtually the same angle of the church, the long axis of the friary was pretty close to the orientation of the Royal Road that extended from San Luis to St. Augustine on the Atlantic coast. The primary entrance of the friary, like that of the church, opened onto the central plaza of the town. The friary had a domestic function. It was home to the Franciscan friar or friars assigned to San Luis. It was also a workspace, but the friar didn't labor alone. He probably had several Appalachian assistants, such as a porter, a sacristan, and a fiscal, who was able to perform some of the duties of the friar. It's possible that some of those assistants actually lived in the friary. Those helpers would all be males. According to the friar's vows of chastity, women were excluded from most contact with them. The friary should have a number of different rooms within it, a refectory where meals were to be eaten in silence. Offices, workshops, and storage rooms may all have existed within San Luis friary. The Franciscans also took a vow of poverty, and the cells that served as their living quarters should be small. Interior partitions and interior space divided into rooms should be apparent, unlike the church, for instance, in which the main portion seemed to be open. Beyond its residential function, the friary served as a kind of educational center. Of course, religious education was paramount. Church doctrine had to be memorized and understood. A number of prayers, some of them in Latin, would also be committed to memory. The choir that sang in the loft within the mission church was taught to sing the mass, and this would also have been in Latin. Beyond religious instruction, rudimentary education was also given, especially to children. Official visitors periodically traveled through the mission provinces to see how things were going, and they often left a series of orders for the missions. 
On at least two occasions in Appalachian province, those orders included reminders to establish schools for native children, particularly within the larger missions. The schools were to be administered by the friar or by someone capable of basic instruction. The orders added that a field was to be sown and harvested for the benefit of the teacher, just as fields were planted and worked for the friar. It isn't perfectly clear whether both boys and girls were expected to attend these day schools, at least beyond the religious instruction that both received. An account by a visitor to the missions in the mid-1670s specifically said that both boys and girls attended classes. A later account of a mission school on the Atlantic coast indicated that only boys attended it. Beyond religious instruction, the education probably didn't go very far. It appears that few Appalachians were fully literate, but even in Spanish society, literacy was a skill few achieved. Before we talk about the archeology span of the friary, I want to mention the modern network of water lines along the north and east sides of the building. Yeah, you may see them in a couple of images. They were at such a shallow depth that they didn't really disturb the friary's remains, but uh, when you see those pipes, that's what they were. So what did the archeology span of the friary reveal? The friary measured a little over 21 by a little over nine meters, or about 70 feet long by 30 feet wide. It was built with wattle and daub technology, clay plastered over a wooden framework of posts with smaller wooden elements woven in, around, and between them. That clay plaster was whitewashed inside and out to help seal and protect the daub from weathering. The friary also displayed a prepared clay floor that, like the clay daub, was baked hard by the fire that destroyed the building. There is evidence that the Waddle and Daub Friary dates from the last few decades of the mission, after the period when Spanish civilians took advantage of land grants to move into and around San Luis. A fragment of a type of tin enameled majolica that had a manufacturing date beginning about 1680 was found within the westernmost post hole of the southern line of interior supports. It is possible that a smaller structure to the west served as the first friary at San Luis, and we'll talk more about that in the future. The friary seems a rather large building for a single friar's use although there were occasions when more than one friar was assigned to San Luis. It's likely that it was constructed not only for their needs, but also to house visiting friars and authorities. Each new governor of Spanish Florida or his official representative was supposed to make a visitation of all the missions. During 1674 and 1675, the Bishop of Cuba visited the mission provinces. As the provincial capital, San Luis was always on the itinerary, and the friary was built large enough to house these sorts of visitors. Since it was a large, whitewashed, wattle and daub structure that was destroyed by fire, we recovered a lot of fired daub and burned clay. Combining both the interior and exterior contexts of the building, we weighed about six tons of this material. With these massive amounts of fired clay materials, we devised a system of weighing it all, but of only closely examining fragments of burned clay that were over an inch in diameter. Of those larger fragments, well over one and a half tons were definite construction materials, daub fragments with impressions of the wood it encased or with whitewash, and fragments of clay flooring. While a couple of the posts in the church were clearly hewn or squared, many of the friary posts were square in section. One of the hewn posts was identified as pine. The wooden frame of the friary was held together with hand-wrought hardware. Again, including both interior and exterior contexts, we identified over 400 intact examples 
of hand-wrought spikes, nails, and tacks, along with over 1,300 fragments of them. We also recovered other architectural artifacts like cotter pins and a door or shutter latch. Going back to those squared posts, we also identified an iron adze blade from just outside the friary, the sort of tool that would turn round sections of tree trunks into hewn posts. The architecture of the friary was broadly similar to that of the church in that two rows of interior supporting posts ran the length of the building. In the friary, however, there was good evidence in a few places for separate rooms and interior divisions. A short length of a charred sill plate was seen running perpendicular to the long axis of the structure from post mold 67 near the middle of the friary, and shallow trenches demarcated a room in the friary's northeastern corner. There were also lines of orange clay modeling between some of the posts, perhaps evidence of clay packed around the bases of vertical wattles. The clay floor was best preserved in the middle portion of the structure. On its east end, evidence of the floor was patchy, and it didn't extend much beyond the 338 east grid line. Much of the western third or so of the building was affected by a large area of disturbance called Area 66. It looks like someone dug up much of the western end of the structure. It appears that this disturbance dates to long after the mission was abandoned. It wasn't deep enough to completely obliterate the post molds and post holes on the friary's western end. The lower portions of them were recorded beneath the disturbance. Now, San Luis was the only Spanish Appalachian mission whose location was never forgotten. The earliest Americans who moved into and around Tallahassee were aware that a large Spanish settlement had once been here. Area 66 appears to be evidence of the sort of treasure hunting that occurred at San Luis during the early American period. There were at least two doors in the friary and possibly three. The primary entrance must have been at the east end of the building, opening onto the central plaza of the town. There was little direct archeological evidence for this entryway, although I think a linear area of modeled soils extending from the east wall a short distance down the center line of the friary might have been the archeological signature of a heavily used pathway. Another doorway on the west was inferred from the covered walkway that connected the friary with the kitchen. A large oak tree stood right at the northwestern corner of the friary and prevented us from directly investigating this entrance. A possible third entrance was represented by two post molds a little over two meters outside the friary's south wall near its eastern end. I think these two posts were probably an element detached from the friary and we'll return to them later but it's also possible that they represented a covered porch, suggesting another doorway opening toward the church. Now, to look at the mission pottery we recovered, we'll combine the ceramics from both inside the friary's walls with those found outside them. Imported Spanish pottery made up about 9% of the mission ceramics, and rather than tableware, it was heavily weighted toward utilitarian storage vessels. These were mostly sherds of olive jar, which were larger vessels used for transport and storage. Over 90% of the pottery was made by the Appalachians. This probably reflects the fact that Appalachians were doing most of the cooking and serving from the nearby kitchen. It might also reflect those Appalachian males who assisted the friar working and maybe living inside the friary. We found 134 glass beads from both inside and outside the friary. A third of them were larger beads, but most were very small. The friar wouldn't have worn beads for decoration, although he would have a rosary, which was a string of beads used to count a set pattern of prayers. 
Some of the glass beads we found were probably parts of rosaries, but many of them likely belonged to the Appalachians. Vows of poverty notwithstanding, we recovered a single Spanish silver coin from within the friary. It represents a half real and probably came from the Mexico City Mint. There were few artifacts that were expressly related to religion. A faceted jet bead was found just outside the southwestern corner of the friary. These are distinctive beads that were often used as parts of rosaries. A religious medal dedicated to St. Dominic was recovered not far from the southern limits of our excavations. The western interior held a fragment of a large cast bell decorated with a cross-shaped design. Another smaller fragment of a large bell was recovered near the two posts south of the friary's eastern end. That bell fragment is one of the reasons we interpreted the two posts as a bell tower instead of a covered porch. Evidence of a children's game was found in and near the friary. Marbles and marble-like games have a very long history in both the old and new worlds. The game could be played with a variety of objects, but the most common material for imported marbles in the 17th century was stone. We recovered four spherical ground stone items that I believe are marbles. One was recovered inside the friary, two were found just outside it to the south, and a fourth was recovered earlier in the larger space between the church and friary. Two are formed of a gray stone and two are of a cream colored stone. At least to the eye, they all look like they're made of the rock marble. Now, not one of the possible marbles came from a secure mission period context, but I believe their identification as marbles is correct. Remember the day schools at the friary. I think the marbles are evidence of the children that attended them. If they are marbles, they're even more interesting since most, if not all of the children would have been Appalachians. The friary is the only context at San Luis that has produced these little stone artifacts. There is another sort of artifact that could possibly be related to the education that the friars were responsible for. Both slate pencils and tablets were more commonly found on colonial period shipwrecks since navigational information was written on slate tablets and then erased as ships moved to a new location. San Luis had many connections to shipping through the thriving port of San Marcos to the south. Some Spanish residents of the mission were ship owners. Historic documents indicate that just about everyone, Spaniards and Appalachians alike, found ways to profit from the shipping trade through San Marcos. Slate fragments are not common at San Luis, and only a couple have been recovered from good mission contexts. There was, however, a concentration of tabular slate fragments in and around the friary. Thus far, 65% of the excavation contexts across the whole site that held slate fragments were associated with the friary. Additionally, a slate pencil fragment was identified in the deposits of the nearby kitchen. I think it's possible that slate tablets were occasionally used for instruction, just as they would later commonly be used. The recovery of the slate pencil makes this a little more plausible. Now, I don't mean to overstate the case. While the friar would have had access to paper, writing quills, and ink, he may have used a slate tablet or two to record any sort of impermanent information. The quantity of slate fragments in and around the friary wasn't incredibly high, but it was higher by far than at any other structural context at San Luis. Now we'll turn to evidence of diet. The acidic soils of San Luis are unfavorable 
for the preservation of faunal remains, and those from the friary mostly consisted of small, unidentifiable bone fragments. Cow and pig remains were recognized from the east end of the structure, but in both cases were teeth, which are harder and more likely to survive the soil conditions. Gastroliths offered evidence of the use of chickens, even without their bones, and between the inner and outer contexts, about 50 of the polished stone or glass items were recognized. Like bone, shell doesn't usually survive well at San Luis, but the interior of the friary yielded a little oyster shell from mission contexts. Plant foods recognized from those same mission contexts included corn, sunflower, beans, and squash. Among the bean remains were the indigenous beans the Appalachians had grown for centuries, and cow peas, or black-eyed peas, a legume introduced from the Old World, but readily accepted and grown by the Appalachians. The kitchen gives a slightly broader view of the friar's diet, and we'll talk about it next time. The plant remains encountered on the floor of the friary were one line of evidence that its original identification as the mission church might be wrong. The charred corn and beans on its floor included much of their edible portions, suggesting that the foods had been stored in this structure. That sort of food storage wouldn't be expected within the church, but it might be more likely inside the friary. The foods stored in the friary probably also explain the preponderance of olive jars in the imported Spanish pottery. There was evidence of earlier occupations below the floor of the friary. One was probably from the late prehistoric period. Small quantities of earlier pottery types, Fort Walton incised and late Jackson Plain pottery with fluted rims were identified. Soil samples from below the friary's clay floor held plant remains too, but they included only some of the indigenous crops that the Appalachians grew in the pre-contact era, like corn and sunflower, along with items gathered from the forests, like hickory nuts and seeds from grapes. Now, along with the small concentration of late prehistoric ceramics, we also encountered several post molds well beneath the floor of the Mission Friary. Some of these were seen when we were cross-sectioning friary supports, and the depths of their initiation suggest a prehistoric origin. Beneath the floor of the friary, a chunky stone was recovered. Chunky was a game with several variations that was played by many Southeastern Indian groups. According to one European description of the game, the stone was rolled along the ground and the players shot arrows to the spot where they thought the stone would stop rolling. The player whose arrow was closest to the stone when it stopped won the game. This example appears to be formed of ground green stone and it is well finished and smoothed. We have recovered chunky stones from good mission period contexts but they are usually made of ground sandstone. Because it originated beneath the friary's floor, it's possible that this example dates from an earlier period. We also saw evidence of Appalachian construction just beneath the friary's floor that may date to the earliest years of San Luis in this location. In unit 284 North, 326 East, part of which wasn't disturbed, two little discolorations turned out to be a cob-filled smudge pit, we called it feature 109, and an associated post mold. The post mold was originally called Area 600, but it was redesignated Post Mold 117. The combination of smudge pit and post mold appears to be a signature of mission period Appalachian construction. The corn cobs filling the bases of the smudge pits are a result of intensive corn agriculture, which was ramped up during the early mission period. Another concentration of corn cobs in dark brown soils 
was located just beyond the north wall of the friary, but it seems less likely to have been a smudge pit. There were no artifacts in any of the earlier post molds or smudge pit to help date them, but their presence indicates that native structures once stood here before the friary was constructed. At least the mission period Appalachian construction probably reflects the early period of Mission San Luis, prior to the 1670s, before additional Spaniards moved into the town and province to make new lives for themselves to the detriment of the Appalachians. Well, I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the friary at San Luis, and I thank you for listening.